Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, we will get started in just a moment. All right, hello everyone. This is Leah Freeberg from Fluke Reliability and thank you for joining us today for this best practices webinar. For those of you in the US, today is Veterans Day, so extra thank you for joining us on this Day of Remembrance. For those of you who are outside the US, thank you for coming as well. You probably know Fluke as a test tools provider, and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools, from infrared cameras to vibration meters. But you may not know that some of the measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into EAM systems of record. It happens via a framework we call Fluke Connect. Our goal at Fluke Reliability is to better connect asset management data and teams with asset management systems to drive connected knowledge. And of course, that knowledge depends greatly on best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies, and that's what we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. Before the presentation, however, we have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Today's session is being recorded, so your phone lines are muted to minimize background noise. We will be answering questions afterward during Q&A, so take a minute now to find the questions tool in the GoToWebinar dashboard. I want to encourage you to submit your questions as we go. If you have specific questions, I will ask Colin, but otherwise, we will be taking questions at the end, and I will share as many of your questions as time allows. If we have unanswered questions, we'll follow up with you afterward with written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of the session. So don't hang up until the survey appears and you've answered the questions. We're also happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's webinar. You'll see a question on the survey about getting a certificate. Answer yes, and we'll send one to you. Lastly, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Excelix.com website within a day or two. And that's it for housekeeping, so now for the main event. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Colin Pickett, an engineering consultant and vibration condition monitoring expert. He'll be presenting on a best practice guide to condition monitoring and vibration analysis. Colin is an independent engineering consultant with 35 years of experience in the condition monitoring industry. He spent nine years with ProofTechnic UK and has since moved to the United States and started his own vibration condition monitoring and reliability consulting business. Colin is a ProofTechnic Proof approved vibration trainer, analyst, consultant, and application technical engineer. He's also a Mobius ISO Cat3 vibration specialist. Before working at Proof Technic, he spent 15 years with Vibration Control LTD, a UK vibration consultancy, and seven years as an independent reliability consultant for a major UK cement supplier. Welcome, Colin. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, thank you for that great introduction, Leah. It's nice to be here, and uh, welcome to everybody to this webinar. So I have to ask, with all those years that you've been doing reliability and vibration work, what are some of the most difficult environments you've been in? Well, I have worked in a wide array of uh, industrial environments over the last 35 plus years, uh, each with their own challenges. I do prefer the clean environments and uh, of the food <laughs> industry and, and the super clean environments of the silicon jip businesses. They're, 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 they're nice and there. The heavy industries like the cement and the steel, well, they can be hot, dirty, very dusty, which can right. bring their own challenges. You know, you may be wearing a lot of PPE and when you're wearing uh, PPE and you're standing next to a very, very hot kiln on a very hot day, that's not very pleasant. Uh, I can only feels, imagine. Yeah, I and mean, we have all these issues as well uh, with actually, you know, getting the correct data off the machines. You may need to have clean and accessible machines. Well, I've definitely dug out a few motors from product spillages over my time. Oof. Yeah, but the most difficult 
has probably been the um, animal feed industries. They can be, uh, you know, they take a little bit of getting used to because sometimes they smell quite badly. Yeah. Yeah. And, been, and as a big motorsport fan, I've actually been lucky enough to work with a UK based Formula One racing team uh, oh. where we set up a condition monitoring system on their high speed rolling road and their wind tunnel. Okay, now we're all jealous. That's very yeah. cool. I've actually worked on some secret underground bunkers as well, which I'm not allowed to talk about. Oh, okay. We'll have to have coffee afterward and you can tell me all about it. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that introduction, I will turn things over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, oh, there we go. click on here. There we go. So, this is, as we said, uh, a best practice guide. Well, we call it a guide. I call this my guide to best practice, as there's, there's always more things to add which make up the best practice. Uh, people do write books on best practices for condition monitoring and vibration analysis, and unfortunately, this isn't a book. Uh, but this will help you, hopefully, establish a good condition monitoring and vibration analysis routine and help you pick up some good vibrations. So. I'm going to start with saying, making this bold statement, uh, vibration analysis is not condition monitoring and condition monitoring is not vibration analysis. Okay. Condition based monitoring is regularly checking the condition of your machines and looking at for changes that have happened in the data that's collected. And that can be any type of data. Vibration analysis is the analytical method of looking for and identifying the machine faults in the vibration data. Condition monitoring should and most likely will include vibration analysis process of your machine. It's, it's very common to have that. But you may want to take other data and maybe you should be taking other types of collection methods, temperature, uh, ultrasound and that type of thing, depending on your abilities and what tools you have available. Most condition monitoring programs in use vibration analysis or use vibration to collect the uh, data because it's the most cost-effective way. It's a very easy way to get into it and it's very easy to produce good data from that. Uh, vibration analysis data is usually actually done at a lot higher resolution than the condition monitoring data. But with today's fast and powerful vibration tools, we can that can allow us to take both condition monitoring data and vibration anal analysis data uh, together when they're set up correctly. So having the correct tools and the correct setups uh, can help there as well. So we now move on to a poll question, our first of a, a couple of poll questions. And uh, what I'd like to know is, uh, do you perform any condition monitoring and vibration analysis on your site? Yes, there is a slight difference between the two. You may only do condition monitoring or you may do vibration analysis as well. But I'd like to know what answers and what, what type of uh, planning you have on that. And the audience has already started answering. Excellent. We'd like to get about three quarters of the audience to vote here. So that, again, sure. Colin has um, a good feel of what perspective you're coming from. And as he's just explained, uh, condition monitoring versus vibration analysis. Give it your best your best uh, summary here. Select just one answer. Obviously, are you doing it in-house or contract, but you are planning or you're not planning or you're not sure? We have about 64%, so I'm hoping to get just a couple more answers here. Give it your best shot, and then I will share the answers and we'll get Colin's take on uh, how we're doing out there. All right. We are just about there. I'm going to close this down in about five seconds to get your vote in. And there we go. And Colin, 44% of our audience have an in-house team that they are doing CM and, and vibration analysis. Oh, that's and good. Then, yeah, and then we have a pretty interesting split happening where we have 16% say they have a contract company. Mm -hmm. Another 16% are actively planning 16% are thinking about it, so they're saying no, but we may do it at some point. Right. And 9% say not sure. So how interesting. What do you think about that? Well, they're not sure. Obviously, it may be that they don't know because they're not in that department that runs that. But it's uh, you know, so that doesn't surprise me. There are some not sure. But I'm really like to know that they, they have in-house teams. That's good. I mean, mm -hmm. you the way around. I'm, you, I'm, you know, there's a lot of contract companies out there that do uh, you know, condition monitoring where they only turn up every couple of months and take data. So that's interesting. It was really good that there's a lot more out there that have in-house teams doing it. That's yeah. Good. Thank you, audience, yeah. for Thank sharing that information. Yep. And I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. 
So one problem for, uh, uh, that the uh, an analyst has to face is, uh, is the actual machine actually worth collecting data from? You know, so it could be uh, a problem there that you don't know about uh, because the machine is, is it important enough? You know, you need to know these things. So you should have done a criticality study. So if, if that machine is not critical, then do you spend a lot of time on it? If it is critical, you spend a lot of time on it because that's what it's all about. I was working, as it said in my intro, with a major cement manufacturer in the UK. And I called a fault on a small machine that they had classed as non-critical. And it was a just a small bearing that would have been about $50. Uh, and to change that bearing would have been about 500 because it was a few hours of work. So there's about a $500 charge on there. But they didn't actually fix it. So even though I'd said, this is critical, you need to sort it out. They didn't say it was critical because it's just a small little machine, but it failed. And it led to 16 hours of downtime. And at $10,000 an hour, that's a, quite a big number that they've created already. But you don't know how that loss of production that they've achieved there with 16 hours of downtime could have affected their sales. You know, are they then not fulfilling orders? So the confidence for, uh, with their customers is then uh, uh, falling away. So that's not good. So these failures do add up. And armed with an array of display formats and data collection techniques and frequent sample, is, uh, sample selections, the analyst can get caught up with the process of the data collection rather than the systematic solution of the problems that are happening there. So, you know, do you have all the correct information? Some of the basic steps are often overlooked and a key element to help you analyze the data is missing. So the most important thing that we're there is that you don't forget the obvious. And the obvious one here is confirm the running speed. Analysis cannot be done without correctly knowing the running speed of your machines. It's my number one thing that I'll always keep going on about. Okay, so confirm the running speed. Condition monitoring should be an adaptive process. The analyst needs to be able to determine what piece of data to collect based on the data that is already taken. So if he takes a, an overall velocity reading and it breaches an alarm, then you should be taking uh, some spectral data to find out what caused that alarm. OK, so it's difficult, but because there is a variation in the the way I think it's difficult to lay out all the data types that you want to collect uh, from every machine. You know, you need to know what's going on out there, but not all the data can be collected at the same time. So can sometimes vibration analysis doesn't fit into a pre-programmed route of condition monitoring routes. So it can be a little bit different there. So you need to be able to take advantage of all the capabilities that are out there. There's different measurement types. Uh, you should have a good knowledge of your machines and the types of data that can be collected from them. It's no good taking ultra high frequency uh, ultrasound data off a, a bearing that's a fluid film bearing because there are very little ultrasonic going on in there. I mean, you can take the data, but it's time consuming that you probably don't need to waste on that machine. So the data that you collect uh, that is required for full vibration analysis takes too long. Time is money, and nowadays that's even more essential. The condition monitoring side of it should be just looking for changes in that machine, so you can then go back and look at the uh, using vibration analysis techniques and see what's happening out there. The best condition monitoring surveys, and I have to stress this, have the best alarms, where all exceptions are issues. So. You know, the analyst uh, needs to do more analytical work if an exception is breached. So that said, the alarms should be accurate. You know, that's a real critical thing. We don't want false alarms and wasting time on machines that are actually running normal. Now, setting alarms is very difficult. We have lots of guides. There's you know, international standards guides. There's API guides and things like that. So having a, a guide to help you, that's always useful. So that's a good thing to have. Some vibration faults are very easy to see in the CM data collected. You can see on balance, misalignment, et cetera. Some are a little bit harder to pin down. OK, so to get the best solution as efficiently as possible, the analyst needs to know if and what type of additional data is needed to solve the problem. Obviously, this has got a quite obvious fault here. But what 
did cause it? And most importantly, could it have been prevented? Well, yes, is the answer to here. So we do, we could have prevented this failure because it was reported. This was a major coffee manufacturer in the UK and the motor was reported with a bearing cage issue. Annoyingly, they actually had a spare ready to install, but they didn't do it when we suggested they did it. And of course, it failed. That led on to around $20,000 worth of collateral damage. As you can see, the motor's not sitting on its frame anymore. It actually ripped itself off the frame. Uh, the drive guard was damaged and the motor's probably beyond re, re, uh, recover or repair on that. So it, it probably is ending up in the bin. Okay. So now we're moving on to our second poll question. So uh, it's quite an important thing is, uh, do you keep a record of your machine failures? So uh, yes, for every failure, just for some of the failures, or is it just the critical machines that you're recording on failures? The CMMS system that you have on your site may be able to uh, record all of this, and the CM software that you're using should also be able to record this information. Uh, indeed, Colin, and when, uh, when you get to it, we have some questions about what software people use for collecting data. But yeah. uh, in, in the meantime, um, Colin is keeping us busy here with questions and uh, thank you everyone for chiming in and answering. So do you keep a record of machine failures, however you keep it, right? Yes, every failure. Yes, some failures. Yes, critical machines only or no, it's too hard. And we've got about 64% of people chiming in. So I'd like to get mm, a few more of you in here so we can say we got three quarters of the audience so that Colin really knows what's happening out there. Um, so call this for Colin's benefit. All right, we're just about there. I'm gonna give it five more seconds and uh, get your vote in, make it your best guess. I'm gonna close it down and share the results with all of us. Colin, 39% are recording every failure, 33% are recording some failures, 22% mm -hmm. are recording critical machine failures only, and 6% say it's too hard. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's just too hard, uh, or these things happen and you don't get to know what the answer actually was. But you should be recording every failure that you have. And the data that you collect about the failure can also then help you determine whether that particular machine uh, failed for a reason that's common. So you see the same failure, uh, you know, every six months or so on a particular mm -hmm. machine. And mm -hmm. it may be that then you know that that machine is not rated correctly for the type of job that it's doing, or it needs some sort of modification to it. We talk about root cause analysis, how we get into finding out why a machine failed. You can't spend all the time doing that, but some Simple statistics can always help you and get you in the right direction of how you should be moving forward. All right. As always, there are many questions we could ask about this, but let's have you continue on. And audience, I want you to keep entering your questions. You're doing a great job, and we will get as, to as many of those as we can at the uh, in the Q and A hour. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. Okay. So I have some condition monitoring principles. I think there's four main principles that we should be looking at. We have our detection which is our trending we're looking for trends that change or uh, levels that arise so we can see something has gone on uh, then we have our analysis you know when a, when a change actually happens we then need to analyze what that problem was and what the nature of that problem was the correction well that is when somebody actually carries out the repair that you're suggesting that needs to be done change of bearing change of motor balance the fan do the alignments whatever that is but the most important one to me is the verification is to then confirm that it's actually the work that has been carried out has actually fixed the problem. The fix needs to be fixed at the end of the day. Trends that we take, well, we, this is a, a vibration trend, an overall vibration trend, and you can see against an alarm, we've got some uh, rising trend going on there. Other trends that can happen, well, for infrared or temperature, we're looking for changes in the temperature changes. Infrared thermography is very cheap nowadays. We've got uh, very pocket-sized cameras that can do that. It's always worth carrying one of those around with you. If you're doing oil analysis, the objective there is to look for the contamination levels or how the additive packages are reacting are they breaking down so you may need to add more additives to the oil uh, there's ultrasound and acoustic emission and the objective there is to listen to what's happening are they increasing in the noise levels that's going on so your detection is finding all the faults 
okay? Then the analysis picks those faults and actually analyzes what's going on in there, okay? The analysis is usually done via some sort of spectrum analysis, whether that's on velocity, acceleration, bearing envelope spectra, or even ultrasound spectra. The spectral analysis is all part of a process called the fast Fourier transform. We take the raw data, uh, we run it through a fast, for, fa fast for Fourier transform, you saw that when you're drunk, fast Fourier transform filter and FFT, the circuitry that goes with that, and that gives us our vibration spectrum. The analysis uh, then of the spectrum shows that there are certain peaks at certain frequencies that can be indicative of a problem. Again, for oil analysis, the presence or absence of peaks are in a specific wavelength, that can indicate a problem. Uh, current signature analysis on motors, that can also indicate the electrical faults that may be happening in that machine. Okay, the peaks at the 1x, for example, are the unbalance. Uh, they're usually that case. Okay. The peaks at 2x and 3x, that's usually misalignments. Uh, for two times line frequency, whether that's uh, 60 hertz or 50 hertz, it's the electrical problems there. And the non-synchronous peaks are usually the bearing faults. So these are important things that you're looking out for when you're doing your analysis side of it. From the detection and the analysis, you found and identified a problem, whether that problem, whatever it is. That's giving you time to plan the repair. That's what it's all about. The condition monitoring is not just to see what the current health is, it's also then to try and predict when something is going to fail because you're seeing it get worse. So if you can plan the repair and plan the correct tools that you might need, or even the correct materials, getting the spare motors, getting the right bearings, and even the correct personnel to do the job, is it, does it need an alignment? Does it need a, a precision balance carrying out on there? So you need the correct people around. This all helps you because you're not having breakdowns that cause you losses of production and collateral damage. This means that you're keeping downtime to a minimum because you can plan your stoppages. That means you get your uptime to a maximum. That's what we're all after. Uptime gives you more money. It, condition monitoring is obviously helping you eliminate downtime. Then we move on to the verification. What I think is probably the most critical part of it is okay, somebody's telling you they've changed the motor, but you need to confirm that. The verification that's actually happened, that the correction has been done correctly. The after repair here is really, really hard to see when we're doing a complete, the same scale, we can't see the trend or the vibration spectra that are there. So this is a new baseline that I need to set as a reference now. So I've now got a new baseline part that's there. You may even need to change the alarm levels to suit the new data from the new machine because the old machine was already partly worn when you started collecting data from it. Now you've got a best setup, best possible way of knowing that this machine is all in good condition, you may need to adjust the alarms. So then if a similar fault occurs, you should be able to see earlier. So what happens when you actually suspect you've got a problem? Well, all alarm exceptions that you see need to be investigated. How you set the alarms? Well, that's usually historical data or reference charts that we have that all, you know, best practice will tell you all about these things. So the more, in, uh, more knowledge you have, comparative machines, you can check the machine vibrations on all of them and set an alarm for each one of them. Or you can just generally put alarms over things. When you do get an alarm, you need to investigate it. Some faults, as we said, are really easy to see. Some are a lot harder. But these are some of the things that you should be doing uh, to help to see what's happening in your machines. So again, this following on is my best practice guide to condition monitoring and vibration analysis. These are things that I think that may help you find out what's going on with your machines. So the major one that you should be doing is looking at any machine history. If you've got history of the machine, you should be looking back to what it was doing this time last year, depending on how often you're checking it, this time last week. And then you can see when things change. Experience has shown though, that the operator and the maintenance personnel of the, who work with those machines every day, they provide a really good insight to what's happening. They, they, you know, so the break room is actually a really good place to find out what's going on because you can talk to these people uh, and they might see things that, or that you've not collected in the data yet because they're seeing it or hearing it or smelling it before it actually happens. So you should be asking questions. You ask questions to gain knowledge. So you might be visiting it once a month. They're with it every day. 
So when something does happen, ask the correct questions. Was there a sudden increase in the vibration? Was it a gradual increase in the vibration? They've been uh, with it for every day for the last 30 days when you've only seen it once in that 30 days. So they might pick up that every day it got a little bit worse. Did this machine always run this rough or has it ever run acceptably? Okay. Has there been a change in the performance? Uh, is it because there's a new process that's gone in there? Have they changed what it's actually doing? So these questions keep going. You have to na narrow things down a little bit. So when changes have been made, was the type of a modification that was changed? Was it a structural change? Uh, was a repair carried out? All these simple things that you should be asking all the time. This is a common one, a new machine in the area. So the vibration data has changed on your machine that you're checking because it's got an inter interference vibration from machines that are around it. And that's a common thing that get, can happen on your site. Electrical changes. Uh, I've been to a, ma a machine that was a fixed running speed machine. And the next time I go to it, it's now got an inverter drive on it and it's a variable speed machine. So, you know, you need to know these things. Were the pulleys changed or was the gearbox changed? And did it come back with exactly the same like-for-like uh, -like components or has the pulley got a little bit bigger, has the sheave got a little bit bigger? Changes in the machine load, that's a common one that happens, or changes in the product which affect the machine load, which then change the speed. So the most important thing, as I said, confirm the running speed. You need to know that. Don't forget these basic things. You also need to get the machine details. Know what makes up the machine. The amount of time spent on this step is largely determined by how complex the machine is. Yeah, it may be necessary to shut the machine down uh, so you can get all the data. Ideally, this should be completed when the machine is actually running in good working order before any problems exist. The machine details can include a digital image. Uh, I usually do drawings of them or take photos nowadays with your camera. It's uh, very easy to do. And you should be marking uh, the uh, input and output speeds. You should note that. And obviously, the machine measurement locations, where are you actually taking the data from? You need to get all the relevant data for the complex machines, the gearboxes. You may even know, you need to know, you not may need to know, you actually need to know how many teeth are on each of the gears to identify what's happening inside that gearbox. And of course, the operating conditions when you're taking the data, they should be recorded. Is it running at 100%, 50%, 60%, 60%, what type of load it's on, and things like that. How many amps is it pulling at the time? This is all stuff that should be available to you through all the other processes that are happening around the, the plants. And of course, confirm the running speed. Number one thing you need to know. I've had machines change speed while I've been collecting the data on them. That's very common as well on variable speed machines. So identifying the data locations is very important. You need to develop a standard for yourself to number and label each measurement location. Now, this is usually done in the software, depending on which software type you have. So you need to do this so it's easily identified, for, not just for you, but for other people as well. So a widely accepted method is the identification to start with the outboard bearing, the furthest one on the driving unit. So it's the furthest away from the center of the machine, if you like. We identify this as bearing number one or the non-drive end of the motor. And don't forget to put in the direction that you collected the data from. Horizontal, vertical, axial. Best practice says measure all three. In the real world, we know we can't always do that. But so for condition monitoring, you may only be measuring in one direction. But when you need to do some in-depth analysis, you definitely should be taking measurements from all the other directions. You work through the drivetrain until you reach the outermost bearing, the furthest away from the start point. So that might be going through a motor, then a gearbox, and then a pump or a fan. Obviously, you advance the bearing number and you advance the designation for each measurement location. So it'd be the driven end horizontal and things like that. Okay. In some situations, uh, vertical machines, they can cause all the problems. So you then, because you're measuring radial, you may need to do north, south, east, west, or on the inlet side or the outlet side of a pump. That's a little bit more descriptive. And don't forget, confirm the running speed for every component. If there is a belt drive in there, the motor is running at one speed, obviously the fan could be running at another speed. Okay, So that, again, is really important. So... 
The machine pictures and the machine details should include several things that can provide any clue to the source of any future problems. You need to get to know your machines. Find out the important information, like the bearing type. Are they rolling element? Are they sleeved? How are they lubricated? Uh, record the coupling or the sheave make, size and type. Note the inputs and output speeds. We said that, confirm the running speed. It's always going to be the one. Uh, how many blades are on any pumps or fans? You know, so we need to know these things. Uh, gearboxes, very complex sometimes. Machines with gears like uh, screw, convert, screw compressors, they have gears in there as well. You need to know how many teeth are on all of these gears. And all of this information should either be in your CMMS system or in your database. It's usually stored in the database so you can use the uh, frequency markers of those gear sets and put them over the data so you can easily identify them. Best practice, of course, is to have all of this information before starting collecting any data. It's already in your database before you even go out and collect any data. So you've got a criticality of the machine, you know how important it is. And then you know what type of measurements you need to take because you know the machine type and what it's got. If it's got uh, high speed acceleration, readings are needed because there's high speed bearings in there. So you need that information. Uh, knowing the load, and of course, we always keep saying the speed, really important. Analysts are usually eager uh, to jump in and start collecting data without getting the overall feel of the machine's general condition. Before you do anything, have a good look around. You know, any faults that you see uh, are easily recorded. It's one of the things that should be seen. You should look around, see any de defects that you can visually see or can hear any problems. That should be documented in either the condition monitoring side of it, it's really important there, and on the vibration analysis side of it. You should be looking for loose or worn or broken parts. Leaking seals, really common, especially on the, all the water pumps out there. The foundation and the structure, does it have cracks in it? Uh, excessive lubrication, the, probably the most problem, problematic thing that's out there. You know, your senses will help you to have a good look and listen and even a smell is something burning. You know, you can smell these belts burning sometimes. And of course, confirm the running speed. We always recommend collecting overall velocity readings, some sort of overall vibration, because it's easy to put these against an alarm specification for the machine type based on the international standards, the ISO that comes with it, or the API standard that goes with it. They're quick and easy to take, and you should be taking them in all directions wherever possible. Okay. Uh, the higher the amplitudes, uh, the closer to the source problem. You know, if you're taking a high, uh, vi high vibration reading vertically uh, on the drive end of the motor and on the drive end of the unit that it's driving, then it's more than likely the vibration is around where the coupling area is because that's what's happening there. So, you know, this can help you focus uh, if time is short, you know, so you can see what's happening and gain knowledge, you know, for that particular area. You should also have some sort of uh, overall bearing condition measurements. Uh, we use shock pulse. Yeah, shock pulse is one that's common one that's out there. Other forms of uh, acceleration, high frequency detection are out there. The spike energy, uh, the, the SKF have their own uh, overall figures that can work with that. These readings should be made on all rolling element bearings. These bearing condition readings can help you focus, again, attention to the bearing or quickly eliminate the bearings as an issue. There is other methods like ultrasonic uh, emission or ultrasound. They can be do things. You can take readings and listen to what's actually in, happening inside the bearings. And as I said before, best practice says collect vibration spectrums. So you've got to collect all your spectrum data, uh, velocity, acceleration, envelope spectrums, and even displacement where necessary. And in every direction, each plane horizontal, vertical, and axial at each bearing point uh, to provide a complete picture of all the frequencies that's happening. So the vibration amplitudes that are affecting that machine are recorded. You've got to avoid taking data off loosely supported structures like uh, cool, uh, coupling covers and motor fan shrouds. They will not transmit all the data. They'll sh shake at their own frequencies. Uh, but vibration checks at other points other than the machine bearings can actually help you identify things like structural problems that are affecting the machine's performance. It's not always necessary to record that data, but best practice is always save the data if you can.
the analyst should be looking for significant changes in amplitude. Uh, I had an example a few days ago where the horizontal reading was a couple of millimeters per second, but the vertical reading on this motor was 20 millimeters per second. Well, that's unusual that one direction is massively higher than the other direction. And we worked out that that was a structural problem, that the motor holding down bolts were not fitted correctly. So it wasn't bouncing side to side, but it was bouncing it up and down. So you should be checking foundations, uh, the mounting feet, the mounting bolts. Piping is a good thing you can do when you're starting to analyze what's going on. Uh, going across all the mounting inf interfaces, checking the background vibration and the floor vibration. These things are all important. If the machine time is limited so that it doesn't run very often or very fast for a long time, you, you may not be able to collect all the data you want. So sometimes you need a recording tool. Uh, so, you know, most some data collectors, uh, again, the VivExpert 2 does this, it can have a recording function where it will uh, record the data over an amount of time or be triggered by a vibration change. So, you know, it's starting and it takes data. And of course, Label the data correctly. Now, I know that you thought that was going to say check the speed, but you do need to label data. You do need to know where that comes from because so it helps you analyze what you're measuring. So if you're uh, or piping, label the direction it was measured in. Make sure you've got that covered correctly. You also need to make sure that you're taking the correct spectra data. Root based spectra is usually set up for fast data collection. So that might not give you the accurate picture of the vibration uh, that you want. So high resolution data is always better, but it takes longer to collect. So we end up with a compromised resolution for our spectral data. That's the common for it. Uh, but when there is an issue, you have to go back and take better data to get a better diagnosis. So you can know the faults are correctly diagnosed again. Today's fast and powerful data collectors can take the high resolution data quite quickly. And some have alarm breach triggers. So when you're collecting condition monitoring data, they will then take, when there, an alarm is triggered, it then takes extra data. So you get the, the high resolution data only when you needed it. Oh, I do apologize. I'll just flick too many slides forward there. So come back to this one. So as I said, check the frequencies, if the machine is under load, you then need to know about this. So the machine is under a, a changing load or a speed. Uh, th that's another way you need to take more data on that machine because you may need to check it at all the different speeds of the ranges that it covers. So you need to may have different amplitudes and frequencies appearing because it's changed speed. So you may need to take a lot more data. And uh, that's really important as well that you do get that capture. Uh, phase, this is another thing that we call it the forgotten parameter because not many people do this. It's a pivotal part of it. It's a fundamental tool when it comes to vibration analysis. It can confirm faults quickly or tell them that there's no fault there. It can check that there's an unbalance or a misalignment. It confirms that. It's usually collected with a triggered input such as a laser tack or a, a photocell, a key phaser, or even using a stroboscopic light. I've done that with, you know, in the old days using lots of strobes. And we can have that whether it's actually the strobe is flashing to a filtered vibration amplitude that we're, that we're concerned about. The analyst should always record the phase information if he's doing diagnosis. So this is the vibration analysis side of it. This is the high end, the extra bits that you do. The exact number of degrees is not needed for the evaluation of the vibration problems. We allow th plus or minus 30 degrees because there's always some little bits of variance in there. But this example here, we've taken a, like a clock face, a one, two, three, four, or a 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, we could do that. We've taken phase at each of the faces on that particular bearing. And in this case, it's looking for a possible bent shaft because the, uh, the phase angle should be the same in the direction that you're measuring it for all the points. Then you know that that machine is moving in the same direction. As soon as there's something different, there's something wrong. Does your machine do cross channel phase? That can be done without a taco, which is a really useful thing. So, you know, you need to check, can you, you, if you can't stop the machine and put a laser tack on there or take a speed reference in some other way, can you do it with cross channel phase? So does your machine do that? Foundations are always a problem. 
Loose foundations and soft fault are very, very common out there, and phase can easily confirm them. When you're doing a, a quick check, you can do a quick check of the mounting bolts, working from the mounting bolt to the foot, to the base plate, to the foundations. And what should happen is the phase should be the same all the way down. If there's a phase shift, that's usually because there was a problem there. You know, that's what's happened. Uh, and uh, the phase has shifted 180 degrees because there was an issue, a looseness or something. So here we have a little bit of a recap. Uh, we cover the basics of what we do. The most important one, you're going to know that one, confirm the running speed. I like to confirm the running speed. I'm going to keep banging on about that. Take overall data. If you can, collect as much overall data as possible because that gives you a good indicator of where the high vibrations are. Uh, collect the bearing information. Obviously, if you can do bearing condition measurements, you're eliminating or proving or adding and showing that there is a bearing fault in there. So it's not just out of balance, it's actually got a bearing fault as well. Check vibration levels at different points other than the bearings. So the analysis side of it is to go back and take foundation readings, mounting feeds and floor vibrations and things like that. If possible, take a temperature reading and thermal images. As I said, thermal imaging cameras are very cheap nowadays. You get little pocket ones that are even plug into your iPhone nowadays. So it's really simple to take a, an image to get a good idea of how that machine is reacting. Is it, oh, is it running very, very hot? Make sure you collect the correct spectral measurements. There may be different ones for the condition monitoring, so they are in the vibration analysis. You know, I do condition monitoring and vibration analysis. My spectra setups have different frequency maximums and different lines of resolution. So I do high resolution when I'm doing vibration analysis and medium resolution when I'm doing condition monitoring. Have a good look around the machine. Don't forget to use this computer, okay? You can smell what's going on. You can see what's going on. You can hear what's going on. Is the debris below the coupling or the belts? That's an indicator. Are there any oil or grease leaks? That's a good indicator. Are there any unusual noises? And we just said, are there any unusual smells? And when you have sorted this out and you are collecting the data and you do have successes, show them off. Keep records. Make sure that you tell the right people and say, look, this is what condition monitoring has done. This is what vibration analysis has found. It's not just the fancy screwdriver. Some people do think that. It's great to show it off and say it's a lot more rewarding than that. Try to work out the costs, how much it costs to change and how much it costs if you hadn't have and it failed. That's an important thing. So have that dollar understanding or that currency understanding. Yes, it costs you $3,000 or £3,000 or 3000 whatever to change that machine. But if you had failed in production, how much would that cost as a catastrophic failure? How much collateral damage could it have done? How much loss of production would it have done? The difference between the two is the potential savings. And that means you can show the return on the investment that you've put into it very easily. Uh, I'm proud to say that that cement company I did for worked at for seven years. Uh, I worked at it longer than that, but I started doing the whole reliability thing for seven years there. And we had a two year breaking in period for a brand new piece of kiln. It was a brand new kiln. It was a new cement plant. And then I could say I had five years with no unpredicted failures. And I'm really proud of that. Yes, things failed, but they were predicted that they were failed. So if we know they're going to fail, we can plan for it. And that's how you save money in this condition monitoring age. That's what it's all about. So thank you for listening to me. We now have questions. Hopefully Leah's got uh, a few questions for me to see if I can answer. And if we don't More get to than a few, Colin. Uh, <laughs> we will do our best to get to all these questions. Keep typing them in, by the way, because we have Colin's promise that he'll help us send answers to you afterward if yeah. we don't get to all of them right now. All right. And I believe they're welcome to email you directly, Colin. Is that all right with yeah. the email yeah, address on the screen there? Fine. I've got my email address on there. I'm quite happy to answer any questions I can. Very good. Okay, I'm going to start at the top of the queue actually, which means we're going to roll back a little bit. And if we have already addressed these, that's fine, right? Um, and you just touched again on the difference between condition monitoring and vibration analysis. With condition monitoring is at a higher level and vibration analysis, you're collecting more data. But there are a few concerns about this in the audience. So if you could summarize that for us one more time, that would be helpful. Okay, well, 
uh, I can I'll tell you a little story. I went I went to uh, uh, Heathrow Airport and I met the condition monitoring manager for Heathrow Airport. And what he did was he looked after the toilets. He <laughs> monitored the condition of the toilets. <laughs> he wasn't doing vibration analysis, so condition monitoring can be really applied to anything. It's monitoring the condition of something. Where we're doing it and we're applying it in the industrial for the ro rolling elements, and what we're looking for is the rotating equipment. And we're saying, right, what's my machine rotating like? We need to do a health check. So that's the condition monitoring. That's regularly checking the machines, whether you're taking overall vibration data, just taking temperature, just putting your hand on it and going, it's a factor of three. You know, vibration analysis is analyzing what vibration you're getting off it. So you can do both. You know, but you can condition monitor anything and it doesn't have to be with vibration. Got it. OK. I, what sort of software do you recommend for collating all of this data? You need a good database. There are a lot of data. I'm obviously a proof technic. You know, I'm, I've been using proof technic for many years and used to sell it. And I think it's a really good uh, tool. The Omnitrend software suite is very, very good at recording uh, data and setting you up in there. But there's other data uh, systems out there. Again, I'm a little bit biased. I've used other people's equipment, uh, but I still, I still recommend proof technic equipment, even though I'm an independent consultant. I actually have other people's equipment. But I still like the Proof Technic stuff. So, but, and it's worth uh, noting cool. that uh, Proof Technic does uh, webinars that are more specific to their technology. So if you go to the Proof Absolutely. Technic website, those webinars are free as well, and you can evaluate what sort of software you might be interested in there. Yeah, you can see me doing some more of those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. I, can collecting data from the horizontal direction be enough to evaluate the machine's condition when there's no noticeable movement on the other directions? Well, is it noticeable in the data or are you just talking about what you see? Mm. Um, this is the thing. You, yes, you can condition monitor just from one position, but you may miss something. You need to measure horizontal, vertical, and axial. We talk about best practice. That's what this is all about, is best practice. Best practice is the measure of each bearing, horizontal, vertical, and axial, as much data as you can get so you can truly analyze what's actually happening in there. But obviously, time is money. We keep saying that. You know, we, you, I would never just measure in one direction unless I was using a triac sensor, which gives me an indicator of what's happening in the other directions. Mm -hmm. uh, mentioned the type of collectors or uh, the sensors that you can use and how you should be doing it but again best practice is to actually uh, clear all the paint and the dirt and everything off there so it's your sensor is being screwed or bolted to it it's fixed on that point or you're using a special connect and plug that grips it and holds it in position or if you're using a magnet you have got all the paint off you have got all the dirt off it's really mm -hmm. clean and you put mm -hmm. a little bit of conductive grease between them but you yeah. can't do that real world you know it's nice to do it and that's best practice but sometimes you just have to go out and collect the data the best you can so if you can only measure in the horizontal that's all you can do all right do you recommend comparing comparing motor current signatures with the vibration signal and if so what should we look for in such comparisons uh, yes i do uh, you can you obviously the motor current signature analysis will pick up things that are happening in that motor they mainly can't depending on which technology you're using uh, there's like new technology from artesis that will find the bearing faults and look for the misalignment and the unbalance other motor current signature analysis uh, softwares will only be looking for the electrical signatures and see the electrical faults in there so if you suspect in the vibration that there's something wrong electrically you may need to go in that's again you're going in to do some more analysis with that and you use the correct technology so get what you want to find out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, good job, audience. Your questions are excellent and keep typing them in. All right, Colin, next one. How do you discriminate between resonance and unbalance? <laughs> well, that's where phase comes into it. Phase can help you out. Uh, if you've got a, if you have a high vibration at the one times that's excessive uh, it may be maybe because of resonance it, you would then take a phase region and if that phase is stable then it's more than likely an unbalanced issue if the phase is moving around or changing uh, it would be the resonance you you need to do more tests basically that's what it comes down to it's not something you can instantly go oh well, that's resonance that's unbalanced you you have to do some uh, tests to find that out you may need to do a rundown test so as soon as the speed changes, 
the unbalance will drop away. But if the resonance, if that vibration disappears straight away, that could be because it was moved out the resonance straight away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any warning alarm limits for the envelope spectrum values of a machine? Not really. This is again, if you came on one of my vibration training classes and we talk about our software and the, and the proof technique software and the range of tools that it works with, uh, I would give you guidelines. There's only ever guidelines for it. Uh, if you're taking envelopes, there's different types of envelopes you can take. You can have a broadband envelope that allows a lot of information in there, or you could have a high average envelope that averages it all down to so get the numbers smaller, and it only keeps the repeats that are in there. So there's lots of different technologies that we need to do, or different types of methodologies, if you like, for the same technology. Uh, and there aren't really any written down rules that go with this. You have to, um, experience helps with this, you know. And, right. And, ask questions, ask, ask people who've already done that type of machine or have data on that machine. Well, I don't know how you could have predicted this next question, but indeed somebody has a very specific question for you. Um, okay. So I'm gonna read it directly here. A question for my ex proof technic colleague. This <laughs> is a fan application at 400 kilowatts. The fan is running at 1500 RPM. How do you recognize when a shaft or ring seal is damaged? Or worn where you should see the frequency defect in spectrum? Yes, you could see a, a rub happening in there. Uh, but because if it's one of my proof technique colleagues, I would say try listening to it with the shock pulse. So you mm. could have a you could actually hear it and you might hear the rub if the ring damage is broken. Uh, so you, see, you might see hear the damage in there on that ring. So that's a possibility that you could see. Okay. How would you describe the performance of wired versus wireless vibration sensors? Good question. Wired will always outperform. And again, yeah. it depends on the sensor. It's at the moment, the technology is not getting you up to listening to ultrasonic. On, uh, there are some out there that are starting to get there, but the average wireless sensor is usually only covering up to a thousand hertz, uh, one kilohertz. You know, some of them are out there up to, getting up to fours and fives and sixes. But when we're doing a, a fixed measurement with a wired sensor coming back to a decent uh, data collector, we can measure up to 40 and 50 kilohertz, depending again on the sensor. Uh, the, the more expensive the sensor, the usually the better the quality of the data you're getting out. Uh, you know, the ICP sensors are, are limited to their frequency ranges and have low resonant frequencies. And again, you know, everybody ha has their favorite sensor supplier. The proof technic sensors have a really good range on them. They're actually uh, most of the portable sensors that come with the VivExpert actually resonate at 36 kilohertz. So it can listen to shock pulse, which is an ultrasonic. You know, we're well above the 20 kilohertz of, uh, the, the, of the sound spectrum and out into the ultrasonic spectrum. They are capable of listening to what's happening above that as well. So I always go with wired over wireless. Depend Again, for vibration analysis, you need a good mm -hmm. sensor to be able mm -hmm. to do that. The condition monitoring, the wireless sensors are good. Right. It's all about the kilohertz. Got it. Yeah. All right. How is your experience with the use of a triaxial sensor with a portable analyzer? Uh, do we have reliable data in all directions, HVA, uh, or do you prefer to take individual directional readings? I prefer to take individual readings because then it gets me closer to the bearings. So I'm, listen I'm always out for finding out what's actually happening in there. But for condition monitoring purposes, no problem with the triax. Again, the triax sensor doesn't resonate to the very high frequencies because of its makeup. So you, we, you know, people will be developing that on. There's more, more technology coming into it to get that, so you can get the higher frequency stuff in there. But the Z direction or the Z direction where the sensor is being placed, whatever point that point is pointing to, that's the data that's getting you the best bearing noises. The vertical uh, and the axial are not going to be picking up any bearing noises realistically. So it's always best to put the sensor as close to the bearing as possible. Triax is great for condition monitoring, not so good for the full-on analysis mode. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get this question right. This is about pumps. So what is the recommended value best practice for velocity, acceleration, envelope and displacement for pumps specifically? Okay, uh, again, it depends where you are in the world. I mean, there are lots of pump 
manufacturers who will have their own uh, setups. If they're vertical pumps, they have their own classification to if they're horizontal. If it's horizontal, use the ISO. If it's vertical, you may need to talk to the manufacturer of what they're accepting uh, as, the, as the, their limits for vibration. For bearing envelope in an acceleration readings, again, that is subjective. Uh, sometimes you can you, the acceleration readings will pick up the cavitation. So you know if you've got cavitation in there, that's high frequency mm -hmm. noise. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to put in a, a limit on what that is. You need to have the machines running well. And mm -hmm. I can't with the you know the the ISO is the the go to. The APIs are the go to uh, sets of alarms. I use them as a guideline. Usually my alarms are a lot lot lower. Any more? Well, I can't hear Leah. Uh, can you check for soft foot using phase? Yes. As we, you will uh -oh. see the phase change over uh -oh. 90 degree flip. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. I got the answer. I got the question. You said you All can right. check for soft foot. OK. And the question. Oh, you disappeared again, Leah. OK. All right, good. Um, oh dear. Well, thankfully we've made it all, almost all the way through. Um, so I'm going to try to keep answering, asking a couple more questions with our remaining moments here. Um, okay. Any experience regarding belt conveyors and condition monitoring? Yes, I have. I've got a, used, back in the cement industry. We use a lot of belt conveyors and like quarry as well. So I looked after a few quarries uh, in, during my time. One of the belt conveyors I used to do was a, a, a four mile walk. <laughs> so it was quite a long walk. Wow. Um, miles out to the quarry and two miles back doing the other side. So yeah, I mean, again, you're looking for bearing faults. So realistically, you, you know, they do bounce around a bit. Uh, there's always the product making uh, impacts on there, you know, so, but belt conveyors, it, it's a bearing. If it rotates, we can monitor it, uh, you know, and again, it's just what it, it's all to do with the speed of the machines. You need to know the speed of each of the conveyors that are going. All right. Um, I'm trying to figure out which are the, are the best questions because we've got more than we could answer now. Um, can you advise on the best way to minimize the resonance of a rotating machine? Again, it depends. What, what, <laughs> that's a big question. You it know. is. It is. Yes, I can. <laughs> <Why was waiting? laughs> uh, yeah, there's lots of different ways of doing it. You know, resonance is there because of either a structural issue, uh, so you can you can change the structure, you can stiffen the structure. You either add mass or add stiffening, or you can add dampers to it to uh, absorb a vibration absorbers. Uh, there's a there's a couple of good uh, you know uh, practice sessions that have been done about that. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so you talked about alarms, right? And whether it's 1x, 2x, and so forth. And there's a follow-up question here about that. Of, I'm just going to read it to you. What is the most effective way of setting warnings and alarms? Is it using statistical analysis, using 2x, 4x, standard division, and so forth? Yeah. Again, there's lots of uh, there's lots of methodologies out there. Uh, so a couple of companies have laid out their plans and say you divide the spectrum into bands and you put certain alarms on there. Uh, you know, the, again, the software can help you do that automatically, uh, wrapping spectra in alarms. Uh, we, we, again, they could call that envelope, and if you like, we we'll wrap a, a spectrum uh, with different alarms for the one X and that, based on the data you've already got. There's the softwares that do that for us. Again, statistical analysis, uh, uh, yeah, that's always the best way of doing it. History is what you do. You collect a bit of data before you really narrow down your alarms, and it should be an ongoing process. Best practice would say every six months you should be adjusting your alarm levels to suit the data you've collected. So you should have at least six months data. You wrap the alarms to suit that. And you may have different alarms in the horizontal to what you've got in the vertical and what you've got in the axial because they react differently. So, you know, you have different vibration amplitudes. You have different alarms for those. So I really should stop, but I have one more question I want to ask you and you're going to have to answer it quickly, okay? But it's a good one. Is it possible to condition monitor mobile pieces of machinery, such as servo motors on, on moving assemblies or the health of robot gearboxes and motors? Yes, it is. And I, again, that's something that I would probably put uh, wireless sensors on, mm -hmm. uh, and I have done in the past. 
Mm -hmm. Good. That was a nice short answer. Very good. All right. If I can get you to forward to the next slide, Colin, because that's we're out of time for questions. We will follow up to everyone else. But uh, I want to quickly talk about our upcoming presenter because this is very cool, you guys. We're going to be joined by several folks from Navi who will be discussing spatial intelligence applications for maintenance and reliability. So this is, this is the 3D imaging that you can do where you create this amazing digital version of your assets and you can include it right in your CMMS. So I really encourage everyone to join this, this demonstration because it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, a little departure from our best practices as far as what's coming down the technology pathway toward us. But this is actually becoming practical. So I would really encourage people to come see. That's December 2nd. And then if you'll follow forward one more time for me, Colin. Of course. Because, of course, next week we have the Accelerate Virtual Conference to look forward to. Uh, again, this starts November 17th. Registration is still open and I want to make sure everyone knows about this tremendous opportunity because if you haven't attended before, this is an instruction focused conference sponsored by Fluke Reliability for maintenance and reliability professionals and there is just a huge array of reliability operations monitoring EAM, CMMS experts presenting. In fact, Colin, I believe you'll be presenting next week at Accelerate, I correct? Be. Yes, See? I've been roped into that. So I'm looking forward to it, actually. So. Yes, yes. So more call and time coming up next week. And as we said, you're on the Proof Technic channel as well. So if you'll forward once more, this yeah. is important. So after I close this, don't go away. So when after I close the webinar, hang on for just a tick because a survey will appear. And we'd really love to get your answers on that. So there'll be feedback questions about today's presentation, questions about what else you'd like to see. Everyone who completes the survey will receive a copy of the presentation. And if you'd like to receive a certificate of attendance, make sure to answer yes to that question on the survey. Also, I'm sure a number of you will want to watch the recorded webinar again since there was so much information. So by tomorrow, a recording of today's session should be up on excelix.com, okay? And you can see that link there in the, in the middle, excelix.com. Go there and find webinars. And that's it for today. Thank you so much, Colin. This was such a pleasure. That was great. I, I enjoy it. I always do. I, the, <laughs> and that's it. There's always more to talk about. And there's always more to think about when it comes to best practice. It's so true. It's so true. And folks, we will get back to you with answers. And thank you, audience. You did a fantastic job. And I look forward to seeing everyone again for the next presentation. But that's it for today. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.